Hi, it's Scott Tempesta from Sailing Anarchy. We're back with another one of our retro videos. Today, we're gonna to take a look at a member of the Shock slash Santana family. Right here behind me is the Santana 525, but that's not the boat we're doing. We're gonna do the Shock 35. One, two, three, listen. So here we are on Shock 35, not just any Shock 35, this is hole number one. Boat was originally called Buttercup. It's been renamed Buttercup. The boat had yellow decks, which you can still see some on here. This boat was by far the fastest of the Shock 35s. There was rumors that the keel was in a little different position and maybe something about the deck was lighter. Not really sure, but it was fast. I love Shock 35s. I mean, I'm so excited about this because I spent a lot of time on Shock 35s. In fact, the boat that we had, well, I didn't have, I was the sailmaker for it, a boat called Slingshot. We won the nationals twice. Uh, I steered the first year, which was very dominant. And then I let the owner hack his way through the second and I managed to get him around the course enough to win the second one. I'm kidding. You couldn't have picked, designed, drawn, or bought a better San Diego boat than the Shock 35. The biggest reason why is the frigging rig. It is so tall. It's almost 50 feet tall. It's 49, maybe a little bit of change. On a 35 foot boat, that is huge. So the power on this boat is just remarkable. I always love the deck layout on the boat. I mean, it's always nice to have a really wide boat. There's just, you can see a lot in terms of when people are on the rail, you can see, you know, inside of them, lots of uh, big working platform space. And the same is true here in the cockpit to a degree. It's good size. You can actually lay out on the thing if you wanted to. Plenty of room for the helmsman and main sheet trimmer. This boat also has check stays. They come back either side. You could call them lower runners, but they're really check stays. And they were definitely used like always, like all these things, just keep the mass from pumping when you've got a lot of backstay on and you're in some breeze. One of the nice things about the boat, although it's odd by today's standards, is you drop down here pretty, pretty steep. And, but what's nice for the grinders, you're right here. I mean, that is really nice. And trust me, you need grinders because the Genoas on these boats are huge. I mean, it's a masthead boat with that giant uh, eye dimension. And so you have big winches. This boat may have been winched up because they came down a little, uh, they were a little smaller, I think, when the boats were new, but really a nice position for the grinders and trimmers to be here. Kind of come up to the pit area, and it's very similar to a lot of boats of this generation, right? Stoppers, halyards, uh, everything sort of right here. So it's not a crowded cockpit at all, and, and that's a really nice thing for a race boat, which is what this boat was. Although when I take you down below, I'll show you there's an amazing amount of space. A lot of you already know, some of you don't. It, it, it's just, it remains one of my favorite boats. A lot because I love the looks of it. I think the cockpit is great. I love that it's kind of a, you know, a, a battle cruiser with that, all, that, all that deck. And I love how fast it is. I mean, to this day, if you bought a Shock 35 in a light air place, you know, not, you wouldn't get one in Frisco, for example, um, you dominate. Now, the problem is you're gonna need 10 people to keep this sucker flat. So that's what all this space is for and the sales are pretty spendy on these things. So while you might get a cheap boat when you're done, it's not gonna be cheap. Trust me, I know. I have an Ericsson 35 Mark II. I've done the, all the upgrades and everything. I spent more on that than I did on the boat, but that's another story. In fact, we're gonna do a retro. We've done the Ericsson 35 Mark II. We're gonna do one on my boat. It's not a vanity project. Yes, it is. But I want to show you what we did to the boat. I have pictures of how it was before, and then we'll show, we'll work some of those into the video. I'll show you what we did to change things, what we added to the boat, what we took away from the boat, and uh, I, I think you really enjoy it. There are a couple of nice features on this boat. Um, one of the major complaints with all boats that had the punched tow rail is putting your legs on there when you're hiking out, uh, uh, not fun. They built these little ramps which is really nice. So your legs actually sit here, not so much on there. 
they still dig in a little bit, but really this, this truly helps. One thing you have with a really wide boat is you have a lot of sheeting angle options. And here, the boat, they came with it, when you put a three up, yeah, this is a normal track, but you find, found out a lot of times in flat water especially, you could bring that thing way further inboard. So they put an inboard number three lead right there, so you have some options for a three. And if you had a three up and you were, it was really windy and you were reaching, you could sheet that thing all the way out to the tow rail. So, I mean, I can't imagine how many degrees that is in sheeting angle, but it's a lot. Okay, here's the obligatory four deck tour. It'll be about 30 seconds. Uh, simple, like boats were back then, just a regular pole, top of the lift, a split four guy, head foil, standard issue aluminum pole. One thing they did a nice job of here is they made everything relatively smooth. They made all the uh, transitions, you know, nice. There's nothing sharp and angly. So it's a big four deck. Uh, and you're not going to run into any dif difficulties up here other than the monster pole and jiving it. Eee, that's a whole nother story. So now let's take a look down below. Pretty surprising. All right, down below the Shock 35. Now one thing you find with some of these older boats, they've been through a few owners, you know, they add a few things that aren't necessarily standard issue, it changed, you know, a few things on the boat, but the essential down below layout doesn't change, hasn't changed. I love it because it's got a nice big open set T here for two very usable bunks. Two bunks up above, very, very usable for any kind of offshore sailing, which you'd kind of be dopey to, to do that with. I'm, I'm kidding, but good sail storage. Two very nice, comfortable bunks back there, uh, quite nice. The V-berth is completely empty, as it should be, and it's a place where you store the stuff that you store, right? It's got an enclosed head there and a semi-hanging locker there. Well, we can't forget the galley, and it's a decent size one, right? Stove, very nice. Ice box there, sink, some containers. Nice size nav station, nowhere to sit, but you didn't have a place to sit when you were navigating back then. Now you don't even use this. You just have your instruments in the cockpit, right? Here's an interesting thing. So what happens with boats over the years is owners personalize them, right? Look what he's done here with the drawers. It's great. Sailing stuff, okay, that's great. Papers, right, okay. Your phone goes there. That's the crew, I'm sure. That's not his. Your phone's going there. Navigation stuff there. The fake drawer there, only because you know it doesn't work. And here, he just stuck the goddamn battery in there. This is battery number two. Yeah, it probably doesn't exactly meet Coast Guard regulations, but what do we care? But there's a personalization of an area that I didn't really see coming, but I like it. The ownership. Let's talk about that a little bit. So again, this is hull number one, the buttercup, as we used to call it, and enormously fast. It's got, it went through a few owners, and believe it or not, Dennis Connor owned this boat for a while. I believe it was called Menace, maybe like Menace 9 or 10 or 20. I don't know. He's had a lot of Menaces and a lot of Stars and Stripes. And uh, he didn't race it all that much, but, you know, had he, no doubt would have won virtually everything in San Diego, especially inside the bay, especially in the light stuff that we have here. So this boat has gone through probably three or four different owners and in typical fashion, they start to show the wear that a 1984 boat would show having gone through various owners. Um, so this boat is, you buy this boat, not for how great it is down below, you buy this boat for how fast, how inherently fast it is. And uh, it's, it's a joy to have a boat that's got a little bit of an edge, but even a stock boat, if it's set up right with good sails, it's just gonna be a killer in light air. And those of you who have them and you race in light air, you know that. Those of you who race against them uh, and you see them go in light air, you know that. It's an interesting comparison, just came to mind here. The J35 versus the Shock 35. And we, of course, we did a retro on a very nice J35. And there's some inherent differences, but if you were to just generally speak about the two boats, you'd say the J35 is a better all around boat. I mean, they go much better in a breeze than these do. These things just tip over. I mean, really, at some point, it doesn't even matter how much weight you pile on the rail, it just tips over. J35 kind of digs in and goes. This is faster downwind in the light to medium. I think a J35 probably starts surfing a little bit better than these things do when the breeze comes up. Now let's talk about some numbers. These boats weigh 10,000 pounds, 4,500 pounds of lead. It's a deep keel, I, well, probably almost seven feet deep, pretty nice. Um, like I said, tons of sail area. 
And you know, you shop fans would probably know who designed this boat. I'll bet the rest of you don't. Shad Turner. He designed a lot of the shocks in the Santanas. He did the 525 that we talked about earlier. And uh, he was kind of the in-house designer. And he did a beautiful job with this boat. I mean, this boat, interestingly enough, is based on another Santana boat. So the Shock 35, the hull and the deck come from the Santana 35, which was an earlier version of, of this boat. It had a fractional rig on, and obviously not nearly as much sail area and not nearly as fast. So basically what they did with the Santana 35 is they said, wow, well, let's just put a giant masthead rig on the boat. I think they did a little bit of different deck layout on the boat, but I don't think anything significantly. But it's interesting how you could take a boat that's sort of a kind of a middling boat. I mean, they go good in some areas where it's a little on the breezy side and they decided to make a SoCal lighter boat. At least that's my interpretation of it. And they just jacked the big rig on the boat and boom, you have a Shock 35. So this is the boat. Those are the numbers. That's the designer. And that concludes our tour of the Shock 35. Hope you enjoyed it. This boat's very near and dear to my heart. I, I spent a lot of time racing them and just loved the boats. Came close to buying this from Dennis Connor, actually, when it was for sale. Didn't quite do it, went in another direction. I'm glad I did, but I would have certainly enjoyed owning this boat and racing this boat. If you like this video, there's a like button down there. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe, and I suggest that you do, please hit that. That really helps us a lot. And when you see this video, jump into the comment section and you know tell us what you think about the boat. Maybe you have an idea for another boat as well, a similar boat, maybe something completely different. We do love the comments, uh, good and bad. Well, the bad, there's never bad ones, right? There will be after this. Um, for Nobleman Productions and for Sailing Anarchy, I'm Scott Tempesta, we're out.